Welcome to the Chaos Plan, where the odds may not always be in your favor. Thank you once again for joining us for another episode of The Chaos Plan. Uh, we are going to be doing my downtime days now uh, with DM Braden helping me out with that. Uh, currently, I sound like a frog uh, getting over a bit of a head cold, so I apologize for that. But hopefully uh, I'll be able to make it through this episode without too much coughing and hack. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you have awoken after... A harrowing event the previous day, having uh, found out that the matron Marjorie of the Lightwater Inn was in fact a carnival hag, and the elf man was a disguised demon of some kind. Having battled them and killed them, you uh, left the ha- the uh, sort of ownership or the guardianship of the children over to the city, I suppose, and then. All of four of you crashed at an inn, and you're waking up now currently. A bit of a sort of haze as to what happened the previous day, perhaps. I would not have slept very well that night before, um, having, you know, all those guilt issues, you know, pronouncing people's dooms, taking lives, and that kind of stuff. Because before I had, other than the cobalt, pretty much everything that I have, you know, dealt with has been animal um, or something other you know, non, non-humans. Um, so the fact that we were actually killing stuff, I, I wasn't really thinking in the moment. So I would be having some issues with that. Um, so I would probably want to seek out the temple of the Raven Queen pretty early and just, you know, chat with somebody there and, and deal with some of the guilt. Sure. While some of the others may still be sleeping and you uh, sort of head out fairly early, uh, having not slept much, you would be sort of awake at an early time, maybe waking up from a scattered sleep around maybe 6 a.m., which is probably normal for you, Bob, as a human being outside <laughs> of the world of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, yeah, I pretty much get up at 6 every morning regardless. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, definitely not something that's normal to me, but perhaps to you. Uh, <laughs> You head your way across town into the Temple District, eventually finding the uh, cellar doors that open up leading down to the staircase and make your way into the Temple of the Raven Queen there. Uh, Within the temple, it's fairly early, so there's definitely not that many people around, but uh, sort of not one that is unfamiliar with darkness or times of night. Uh, You see the Drow Priestess of the Raven Queen uh, Matron Salem, who is just standing there doing some morning prayers over the altar and effigy of this uh, thatch statue of the Raven Queen in the center of the temple. Okay, yeah, I would, uh, uh, you know, wait for her to get what get done whatever she was doing. And as soon as I feel I can interrupt or whatever, get her attention, I would, um, and say that I'm I'm in need of some counsel or some some time here at the altar. I'm having difficulty rationalizing, you know, the slaughtering of people and the pronouncing of doom and all of these powers that have been given to me. You know, I'm, I'm having a hard time with that being, I'm not somebody that has had to deal with that before. So I would like to spend some time, you know, at the altar here and commune. Of course, yeah. She motions for you to kneel down next to her as uh, you begin telling her this. She sort of nods patiently, listening to uh, all of your uh, worries and uh, concerns that you've had over the past few days. And she she uh, sort of thinks about her words before she says them. She says, uh, Some people are not long for this world, and it is 
the natural cycle of death that takes them to the afterlife. But then there are those that walk outside of death, like the being that you are describing to me. And bringing death to them and sending them back to the outer planes is the best circumstance. It may be hard to realize that what you've done is perhaps for the best, but taking lives and issuing out death and doom is a tough thing to get acquainted to, undoubtedly. She just sort of puts a palm on the center of your back and sort of gives you a warm look. Okay, yeah, I would I would take her words to heart and I would probably just sit there in contemplation and meditation until somewhere close to noontime and just, you know, commune and explore these powers and, and try and really rationalize and internalize. And I, I've been playing around with the mask a little bit, you know, um, and so when I really want to disassociate, um, like what the Holler, Harlequin says in the class stuff, um, I would be wearing the mask, but when I want to be Bob and I want to, to deal with all of this as a person, I would take the mask off. So right now I would not be wearing the mask. I would be dealing with this as Bob, as opposed to, as you know, Bob from Earth, as opposed to um, Bob from from this, you know, Bob the Warlock. So I would yeah. be, you know, I would not have the mask on. And like I said, I'd stay there until probably noonish, and then um, thank the temple, and uh, I would drop um, let's see, I don't have much of them. I would probably drop um, five silver pieces at the altar as an offering and uh, go from there. And should then, you know, head out. You, should thank you and um, say, uh, remember, the choice of life and death is often in your own hands. And bringing death to those that live outside its borders is something that is to be proud of. I would, I would nod in the my eyes would be a little bit watery, and I'd put my mask on as I go back up the stairs. Uh, and I'm definitely going to be looking for those guys at the uh, Ale Father's Temple to uh, help wash <laughs> away some of this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude, you want some yeah. drink? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, I would uh, definitely uh, nod my head emphatically and uh, approach the Ale Father's house to have a, a quick, uh, quick carby lunch before <laughs> finding some real food. Oh yeah, there's like a probably like twenty to thirty people passed out on the steps as you're going up, <laughs> but all of the clerics of the Ale Father have like you know uh, bandanas on or like pairs of underwear thrown around their head, and they're always like, <laughs> "Whoa, man! <laughs> Welcome to That's the fantastic. temple." That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I would I would uh, go up to whoever is offering out the holy ale and uh, have a mug, um, you know, throw it back, and then. Uh, hand it to them and thanks uh, with a silver piece with it and uh, go from there and then head out um, to the rest of the city to uh, work on the uh, Tinker's Guild stuff because I think I put that off for too long. Sure. Uh, As you're making your way towards the Tinker's Guild, uh, walking through the streets, you see a couple of homeless people sitting down along the edges. Uh, You see a man with a metal bucket atop his head and a sort of hessian sack for clothing, just sitting there, sort of rocking back and forth rapidly, speaking under his breath. Huh. I have a bunch of copper pieces I picked up from somewhere, so I would, um, you know, when I see a homeless person that, that actually down on their luck as opposed to there by choice, I would uh, yeah. hand them out uh, a couple of copper pieces, because I think it's two copper pieces get you a meal, I think, in the player's handbook, something like that, like a real basic something. So I would awesome. probably hand out two copper pieces to to them. There's probably like a row of like three or four of them. And as okay. you begin handing them out, they're all very, very thankful. Uh, the last one, as you put the money down towards him, uh, he sort of lifts his bucket up off his head and looks at you, his eyes sort of glazed white completely. And he kind of grasps for your hand, shaking violently as he says, uh, Once the sky is colored bright, The false prophet shall mark a vicious war and the rise of a new evil. And then he just sort of stops and looks around and kind of grafts the money and is like, Oh, uh, thank thank you. I immediately write that down. I'm like, "Uh, you're welcome. And then I kind of let go of his hand uh, and I I write it down very, very quickly. I think I've got... uh, 
hey, no, I've got my phone with me. I've got my phone. So I just type it into my phone super quick, um, using up a little bit of the battery life. Uh, I type it in the phone so that I have it in the notes uh, <laughs> or something. Oh, yeah, you pull out your iPhone and begin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, real quick typing away. Like, ah, damn, autocorrect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, he, he kind of looks odd towards it and says what of this magic and I'm like uh, it's a it's a magic notation device and I, I show it to him we'll just real quick show him the screen and I said you said this prophetic thing a second ago and I want to make sure I remember it so I can type it in here but it doesn't last very long and then I'll stealthily click the side button so that it goes dark and I'm like oh that's all the time I have on it for today and then I put it back in my pocket <laughs> He just sort of gives you a nod and slowly lowers his bucket down over his eyes and hunches back into the corner. <laughs> okay. Um, then pondering that and really worrying about the new evil uh, that's about to be unleashed, um, I would uh, head towards the Tinker's Guild at, so that I can get that, that electric motor made and my lantern made um, to get me a few more options on things I can do. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, heading into the Tinker's Guild, uh, you got the. Uh, you're immediately greeted by the person at the front, sort of counterish area, with all the Tinkers around everywhere, uh, readying their works for the day and preparing themselves to uh, make new innovations and whatnot. Uh, you head up the stairs or elevator. I assume there's probably an elevator of some kind, being the Tinker's Guild. You head up yeah. the elevator to the. Uh, I believe it was the second or third floor where see a number of other tinkers similar to yourself working on their smaller projects. Uh, a elder gnome with a long beard and parted white hair is working on a small sort of mechanical toy off in the corner and behind him he has a warforge man kind of looking over his shoulder. Awesome. Uh, I would just find, I would kind of, you know, browse at everybody's projects um, as I was walking over to whatever workbench I was using and um, get to work, I guess. Sure, yeah, you see a D&D equivalent of, like, an electronic whisk for eggs. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> sort of mechanical crossbows of thi- like different things like that. Um, a, I was about to say a blender, but that's pretty much exactly what I just said with the whisk of eggs. Uh, <laughs> A, min- a mini version of that death sigh thing from from oh, yes. uh, the festival. <laughs> yes, exactly. For shav- shaving arms and hair and things. <laughs> oh, helmet, that's terrifying. A helmet with blades on the inside that you just put the helmet on, then when you take it off, you're completely bald. That's, <laughs> that's what's being worked on. The baldinator, as oh, the God. gnome calls it. Uh, <laughs> you make your way over to your desk where uh, you find a number of uh, arrangements of tools that you've uh, previously become acquainted with and set out to begin uh, finishing off your battery and your energy lantern. Uh, I'll awesome. get you a Tinker's Tools check for me, if you will. Yep. Uh, that was a 15 plus 2 for 17. Awesome. Uh, so continuing on where you left off with the battery, I believe is what you were going for. The... Um, the copper that you've started wrapping around and sort of uh, begun fostering that charge to build, you sort of troubleshoot a little bit and begin finding out ways to continue the charge and have it sort of um, sort of deliver the energy that you have within more efficiently. Uh, over the span of maybe a couple of hours, it takes you to uh, finish this off, but eventually you get it to the point where you think that you would be able to both use it and recharge it to uh, sort of uh, put within future inventions. Awesome. I like to think since I, I'm, I enjoy running and that kind of stuff that I have some sort of like pedometer type charger so the more I step, you know, every, each step adds a little bit of charge to it or something. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, yeah, so, uh, and that was for the battery, right? Yes, Okay, then uh, how long do you think that would take? Would I have time to start on the lantern, or do you think that would take the better part of the afternoon? Uh, it's st- I'd say maybe it'd still be like uh, early afternoon now, so you could continue working on into the evening. 
perfect timing for the energy lantern if you finish at night to test it out. Okay, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. So I'll go ahead, and I'm not expecting to get done today, but I'll go ahead and roll just to see. Sure. All right. Nope. Nope. Uh, I may have sketched it out, but that's as far as I got with a (laughs) five total, three plus two. (laughs) Yes. You begin your uh, sketches of your energy lantern. What exactly would it look like? I'm going with the, um, like, like very classic type camping lantern with the, uh, you know, top to it with the handle, but I want to be able to, like, dim it, you know, so I've got, like, the hood on the front of it, so it's it's yeah. very, yeah, very, very uh, uh, D&D hooded lantern style, but, but it's got that convenient little handle on the front of it. Awesome. All right, so you roll at the end of uh, finishing up your sketches, you roll them up, putting them in a backpack, and... Uh, what are your plans for the rest of the day? Uh, the rest of the evening, I'm probably, you know, thinking about that recharging and running and stuff. I really like to, in the real world, like to run to clear my head. So I would uh, head back to my rooms in the Tinker's Guild, and I would, you know, get the equivalent of a pair of shorts or something, and I would go running just within Port City. Um, I'm going to leave the mask off, though, um, because I, I don't want to try and go, you know, running through the streets in shorts and a raven mask. That would probably get me locked up. <laughs> yes. <but. laughs> so I would take that, that me time when I'm not Warlock Bob, when I'm regular Bob, and I would go for a run for about an hour throughout the city, um, just you know, getting a feel for the place. And then uh, when I get back, uh, just have a meal and call it a night. Okay, awesome. You finish up your run uh, having passed many odd and interesting people throughout the city. Uh, doing a wide sort of loop around the entire of the exterior, perhaps or on the interior. Um, you see the many guards that are giving you an eye and giving you a nod as you run past, working on your fitness, and uh, <laughs> you make it back to the Tinker's Guild an hour later, uh, dripping with sweat and exhausted. Uh, some of the other gnomes who are there, not some of the other gnomes, some of the gnomes <laughs> who are sort of walking out from there. Uh, tinkering day kind of look at you and uh, a bit intrigued uh, probably having never taken a run with their tiny little legs in their entire lives <laughs> well and I would I would probably say to them I'm like you know what you guys need to make is uh, a game that you can play while you're running and have different things chase you and and that kind of stuff you know if you can figure out a way to do that uh, that would be a lot of fun because in real life, Bob loves his Zombies Run app and uh, <laughs> is a bit obsessed with it and would definitely miss it. You see some of the gnomes at the front kind of turn their head up and like walk away, but there's one gnome left standing there rubbing <laughs> a small beard, just like, <laughs> 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 Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> He's going to turn into a necromancer and have real zombies chasing him. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, that's fantastic, yes. Oh lord. Yeah, no, then I would just head upstairs, wash up, and uh, grab some food and call it a night. Alright. The evening's rest comes to you a little easier, perhaps, than the previous. Uh, You have more dreams of ravens flying upon a darkened horizon with this dark citadel sitting atop a, a rocky crag, and eventually you wake up in the morning. Uh, feeling rather fresh and having a feeling that perhaps your sleep was influenced a little mm, yeah, just yeah. influenced a little not maybe put put at ease perhaps with your uh, previous dealings yeah I would be a little bit worried about that but I wouldn't concern myself too much a good night's sleep is a good night's sleep regardless of the influence you know um I would, first thing in the morning, before doing anything else, because this would be, technically, we would be breaking right now, uh, and, you know, running the game with Cherno uh, on the 19th, yep. um, and then on the 20th, but I would do first thing upon waking, uh, or maybe the last thing before I go to sleep last night, one of the two, you gave me that Raven Queen quill that I could, you know, write something down to the Raven Queen and possibly get a response. Um, yes. I would write down with that quill, the prophetic deal that the guy said about the new evil coming, uh, and I would write that down um, on a piece of parchment and say uh, some, I said, I would say uh, a person told me this while I was walking through the street does it mean anything to you? 
Uh, and I would do that either like last thing before I go to sleep or first thing upon waking. Okay, just roll a d20. Oh god, first natural one of the night. <laughs> uh, uh, you write it in the book before you head to sleep, and as you awaken, you turn back the pages looking to the text that you wrote, and uh, the text is still there, but there doesn't seem to be any response. Oh well, I'll come back and check it later on. Okay. All right, yeah, then uh, we'll skip 19th and 20th, and then this would be morning of the 21st. All right. Awesome. So then, yeah, 21st of planting. Um, upon waking up, I'd grab a quick meal, and then my only real objective for the day would be to finish the lantern because I obviously didn't have time the last two days to do it. So you're heading up, finishing your meal, and heading straight into the workshop. You were among the first in there. And you get immediately to work. I'll get you to make another Tinker's Tool check, but you can do so with advantage. Oh, thank goodness. Last thing I need is another nat one. Oh, good <laughs> thing, too, because that was five. And that was a 13 plus two for 15. All right. So uh, spending the majority of the day sort of tinkering and working on this, you begin attaching small little flaps to the front of the lantern, get the basic sort of structure down, and towards the end, you finally, slowly and meticulously, begin putting the power charge and battery that you have created into this object. You feel a sudden spark shoot through your fingers as you place the battery in it. Quickly uh, vaulting back, you look and you see a small connection being made with some electricity sort of rapidly moving through that suddenly courses into the lantern and a bright light suddenly shoots out across the room. Yay! I would, of course, because I'm that kind of a guy, whenever I test a flashlight, I make sure that I'm pointing it in my eyes before I test it. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely look directly into the beam of light and then blink my eyes several times, realizing that was stupid, and uh, uh, go from there, you know, jumping with joy and awesome yeah uh, i'd say it's probably mid late afternoon so the uh sky is beginning to darken but as you're holding it out everyone's pretty amazed looking around you uh, it's definitely bright very very bright <laughs> uh, i believe if you were to try and overcharge it you could attempt to blind the whole room <laughs> i probably could but i think in a room full of this many other deadly inventions like the baldinator Everybody oh. being uh, blind yes. would not be a good idea. <laughs> everyone's vision glazes over, and when they when they get their vision back, everyone's got no hair. <laughs> How the hell did that happen? I don't know. Oh, God, that would be funny. <laughs> All right, yeah, no, then, uh, since that took most of the day, I would just, uh, once again, I, I honestly like this idea that I have to charge this thing by walking and running around. So I would definitely run this, the batteries completely out on this energy lantern and then need to go take a run. So then I would uh, go for a run and uh, grab a bite to eat. Uh, same, same routine as last time. All right. As you are running, I'll get you to roll a d20 for me. All right. <laughs> a five. I am rolling low today. So you see a very, very tall... Uh, I wonder, oh, you would know this being Bob, uh, a very, very tall, probably like close to eight foot tall, uh, Furbolg man who is just sort of looking through a book as he's walking in front of you. You're kind of running or walking on the same direction as he is. Oh, he's walking, you're running. And you watch as he's flipping through this, uh, this book. It's sort of bound and looks like a gilded tome almost. His sort of head... Uh, retracts backward a bit as he lets the time go flying and it kind of like uh, falls down onto the ground and flips open and some of the pages begin like rifling through on their own. Really weird. I would, yeah, upon seeing it fall, I'd be like, oh, well, you, you okay? You need some help? And I'd slow down, you know, to get kind of close to him. I wouldn't touch the book, but I would definitely see what's going on. He's like, oh, I don't know exactly what's going on here. I... Uh, I was just looking through my spells for tomorrow, and I uh, something appears to be in my book. Something uh, is in your book. It was like the ink began like dripping off the pages or something. I'm really new to this magic stuff. Uh, is this meant to happen? 
I'm very new to magic, period. But I'm not sure. Uh, can I roll an intelligence check and see if I remember anything like that? Sure, give us an arcana check. Uh, oh my god. With a whole plus zero, that is a three. Oh wow, These yeah. These dice, uh, I'm retiring this dice. This d20 is going away. <laughs> uh, you do not know of anything of such a thing. Thinking back over all the games you DM'd in the real world, you're not sure whether you used anything like this or you saw anything like this in the uh, player's handbook of the monster manual, as per se. Yeah, I'm, I'm racking my brain in real life. I honestly can't think of anything off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> you watch the pages continue flipping and you see some of those sort of little blobs of ink begin lifting out of the words and, like, travelling down the center, uh, center sort of seam of the book and then, like, pooling into, like, this small little uh, sort of oozy thing at the base of the book itself. Crazy. Okay, um, and I'm I'm completely unarmored right now, having been running it, like I said, just a pair of shorts, but I would uh, summon my glaive um, and call my raven to me. I'm sure it wouldn't be too far away. But I would summon my glaive in one hand and um, my raven and uh, just kind of be wary. I would probably try to actually shut the book with my glaive, you know, kind of get the blade underneath of it and flip it closed. Oh, yeah. Nothing says <laughs> nothing says that already like a pair of shorts and a glaive. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, the furbog man is just like, Whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, what's going on here? And uh, as you step up towards it, so as you lean down towards the strange little ink oozy thing, uh, you watch as passing through its blackish uh, liquid exterior are these four almost darts of arcane energy that immediately fly up and are over around you into the night sky and then... Two of them pierce into you, and two into your friend. Ugh! As magic missile, you take five points of force damage, and uh, the other guy falls unconscious on the ground. Oh, good luck. Roll initiative for me. All right. Uh, That is an 18 plus one, so 19. All right. Yeah, I'm having to review all my stuff, because I don't have my Harlequin mask, so I I can't use half of my spells. Uh, This will be fun. This will be fun. (laughs) <laughs> uh, Present digitation. I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're up first, my friend. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just squish the booger with my glaive. Okay. Uh, so that is um, where is my plus four. So then that would be a 15 total. Uh, yes. 11 plus yes. four. All right. And I deal to it. Uh Four points of damage, not not a whole lot, uh, but it is magical damage for what that what that counts. Okay, awesome. So as you strike down into it, uh, you see some of the ink within the pages of the book itself almost splatter, as if like a blood splatter had gone away. But the the words almost like suddenly the ink within the words like dissipates rapidly across the page and like splatters. And as I slam down, I'm like, damn you, Tom Riddle, and you're a horcrux. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 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 Is that that the end of your turn? Yeah, that's all I can do. (laughs) Okay. Oh, wait, no, wait. I get to re-roll that. Um, I get to re-roll ones and twos on damage. So, uh, and that was a two plus two. So let me re-roll that. Sure. Oh, that's so much better. That was a seven plus two, so nine points of damage. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, Some of the pages begin to rip and tear, and, like, a few of them fly out rapidly. It almost looks like this strange little ink creature is bound to this book. Duh. So that will bring us on to the ink creature's turn. Uh, It sort of pulls up on top of the book, kind of in a protective fashion, and it is going to cast a... Fire, fire bolt at you. Oh, you're, you're too close for that, actually. It'll lash you. So you watch the ink begin to, like, turn into, like, a strange wave suddenly, and this uh, pseudopod almost 
lashes out like a whip and then like strikes against you. Well, it will try at least. <laughs> oh, with a 19 to hit. Yeah, that definitely hits. Oh, three points of slashing damage. All right. Down to 18. Yeah, and I realize that my armor class doesn't actually go down because the uh, I have the unarmored defense thing that the uh, Harlequin gets, so I'm still at a 13. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Very handy. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, wait, no, it does go down by one point because my dex is only a plus one. Oh, no, it's charisma. By charisma, so I'm good to go. All right, so... Uh, that'll bring us on to the Furbog Man, who will roll a death yeah. save, and he fails his first one. Uh, if he fails one more, I'm going to have to stabilize him. Uh, uh, that'll bring us to you. Yeah, I'm going to... God, I can't use any of my Harlequin stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and just repeat what I did last time and stab at it with the glaive. And that was a 16 to hit this time. That hits. And that is another seven, so nine points of damage total. All right, you bring your glaive up into the air and strike down onto the book, completely separating it in half, and you watch as the ink goes from this uh, sort of blob above it to a smattering of sort of blackish uh, ink across the pages themselves, and the book looks drenched completely in this black ink, but the thing doesn't appear to be animate anymore. Okay, then I immediately stabilize the Furbolg. Okay. You <laughs> touch down on the Furbolg and he his uh, breathing stops becoming so uh, rapid and he slowly lulls into a sleep. Okay, I would uh, shout to try and get the attention of a cleric or a somebody official looking and uh, get the guy some help. Once he's got help, then I would uh, head back. Oh, no, first I would take a page of the book and I would soak up some of that ink and kind of roll it up uh, and take it with me for study later and um, then head back uh, to get washed up and a meal and go to bed. Okay. I'd say you'd call over, you'd see a half hungover uh, cleric of the ale father who <laughs> <laughs> rushes over and is like, whoa, we need to wake this up and pours a mug of ale down his unconscious throat. <laughs> Which would have healing properties, of course. Yes, exactly, yeah. And uh, he would awaken, sort of spitting out the ale and sort of uh, a bit confused with the whole situation. Okay, I would, I would say good luck, buddy. You're in good hands now. And I would say Ooh. good, and I would resist the air quotes. I would resist that. <laughs> All right, you make your way back to the Tinker Skill. Uh, continuing your run, or do you just head straight back? I would head straight back. I'm guessing at this point I'm probably covered in ink um, and everything yeah. else, so I would unsummon my glaive and I would jog back probably, but I, I would end the run as soon as I got to the Tinker Skill. Yeah, your body is looking like a Rorschach painting as you uh, continue back towards the guild. <laughs> All right, yeah, then I would... Just get back, clean up as best I'm able to, and call it a night. Okay. Another sleep meets you this time, not with dreams of the strange citadel and the dark plain, but just darkness completely as you are uh, taken by unconsciousness and wake up the next morning feeling refreshed. Okay. Then uh, probably for this morning, because I think this is the 22nd, so this will be the last day that we record on. Um, for downtime. So I would first probably go to the temple and uh, chat with uh, the folks there, you know, do my, you know, pay my homage and all that kind of stuff to the, the Raven Queen. And I, uh, I'm running low on cash a little bit. So I would just drop this time, uh, I would drop a whole gold um, at the temple today um, and pay my respects and all that kind of stuff to the Raven Queen. Um, yeah, and then... Uh, after that, I'm probably going to want to... Actually, when I'm on my way to the temple and when I'm on my way back, I'm going to start looking for a tattoo shop because um, I've got some plans for the future and tattoos are involved. Awesome. Uh, sure. Uh, give me a uh, perception check, perhaps. Okay. Ah, this dice is much better. That is a 15 plus... Should we do just 15? Okay. As you are looking... For a tattoo shop, you kind of like gaze your 
uh, eyes down some alleyways and off the beaten path and you see a leather flap that a man exits out of. He looks to be holding uh, a sort of clean bandage over what you can see to be similar ink splotches to what you received the previous evening, but in a more colourful pattern. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, approaching, you'd see within a bald uh, human woman who is sitting on a stool with a man that's kind of uh, hunched over the top of a, not like a desk, but like something that would just sort of uh, hold his chest where he could like have his uh, lats and everything out as far as possible so he'd have his back spread for the maximum amount of artwork. And she would be using the classic, uh, whatever the, the stick the yeah. classic tattoo stick or like sticking, I think it's called. Yeah, I tattoo. think so. That is fantastic. I would uh, definitely be very appreciative of her technique and what she's doing and checking all this kind of stuff out. And I would wait till she gets done. No, I wouldn't like hover right there, but um, I'd wait till she gets done and uh, then I'd uh, approach her. So uh, another probably 45 minutes or so goes before. Uh, the tattoo is finished up and she's made a elaborate dot work portrait of this uh, sort of brass bull charging into a field with a bunch of sort of knights on their cavalry, on their horses and whatnot. And uh, he is incredibly happy with it as he looks in a mirror and thanks her and then hands over some coin in a pouch and then uh, heads off into the street. She just kind of gives you a look and is like, do you have an appointment for today, or...? Uh, I would say, no, uh, I don't. I'm actually here to talk to you about another thing. Uh, I would show her the tattoos that I've got, and I'd say, I, I can feel some sort of strange, because I haven't actually used any of their abilities yet. Um, I would say, I've got some strange, uh, like, magic-type feelings coming from these tattoos that I have, and uh, that's something that I'm very interested in you know, exploring more and seeing what I can do with that. Uh, so I would love for you to, uh, you know, take a look at the tattoos that I've got. And if you are needing any kind of help uh, at all here at the shop, I, I would love to help you out and learn some of your technique. Ah, uh, yes, the old tattoo intern. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I'm thinking later on, no spoilers. Uh, but I'm seriously, I, I love that tattoo alchemist. And that's that's one of the things that I'm looking at getting into at some point. Yeah, awesome. Uh, she would sort of give a nod, looking, kind of standing up and, like, lifting your sleeves up and looking at all your tattoos and inspecting anywhere you say, and says, uh, this is interesting work. What was the medium that was used to create this? I would say um, just standard tattoo ink, but... Uh, I came through a magic portal thing at some point, and I think it became infused with some sort of magic. It seems like I've been able to, when I'm running, run a lot faster without any more effort. And uh, the last potion that I drank uh, seems to have, you know, done a fantastic job, a lot better than what was expected. And I kind of have a sense of knowing... Oh, no, wait, we got rid of that effect, didn't we? The unlocking doors. So, um... I just, I'm able to run a lot faster without getting tired. And when I do drink potions, they, they seem to work a lot better than normal. Hmm. Warriors do come to me with their heritage, they believe in their culture. They believe that the tattoos do give them power. I have some experience with creating artworks of this nature. If you would assist me, that would be great. I haven't had an intern for 20 years, I'd say. Yes, I, I would be more than happy to, to help out. And, and you know, I, I'm not going to you know ask for payment or anything like that. I, I just want to learn some of what you are doing so that, you know, I can maybe explore with trying to unleash some more potential out of these tattoos that I do have. She kind of gives a nod, sort of putting her hand to her chin and looking over your uh, magical ink 
a few more seconds. It's like, so long as you allow me to study your artwork a little more, perhaps. Yes, uh, any, any time. She gives another nod and says, um, perhaps in a week time we can start our lessons and you can allow me perhaps 20 or so minutes to give a more detailed look over what exactly is happening within the ink that is in your skin. Uh, yeah, I will return in a week. Thank you. She kind of motions over your shoulder and a uh, halfling uh, woman looks barely of age to get a tattoo in the <laughs> real world. But <laughs> comes through and uh, derobes herself sitting down and you see that from pretty much just below neck to toe is completely tattooed. She kind of gives you a look over the shoulder and a little wink. Uh, get some more work done on her. I, I would blush because it doesn't take much to make me blush. So I would turn bright red and say, oh, wait, I have a mask on. I would turn bright red under my mask and then uh, <laughs> walk out the door. Before you go, she'd uh, put her hand out to you and say, for a handshake and say, uh, my name is Batari. What is your name? Uh, my name is Bob. Uh, it's fantastic to meet you. She gives you a nod and then turns back around and continues on her tattoo. Awesome. From there, uh, they said I'm going to do the one gold at the temple, and probably at that point, I'm going to start cracking down on getting the uh, guild stuff put together. So um, I probably would also feel bad about not getting my horse out for a while. Um, oh, wait, wait. <laughs> I would have gotten that wagon after helping the uh, Raven Queen. Wouldn't I? That was, uh, they said I had a wagon or something like that I could get after I finished that quest, correct? Yes, indeed. Awesome. Then, uh, having totally forgotten about that, I would go get my horse, Epona, and um, head over to the, the wagon, and I would spend the rest of the day getting it all cleaned up and fixed up, and uh, ready to start petitioning members uh, the next day. I'm sure I probably would have already asked Cherno about it, but uh, <laughs> I would petition to to ask absolutely everybody else and make a royal pest of myself um, trying to get folks into the adventuring guild. The, uh, the wood that the wagon's made of is fairly dark. It looks like a... Not like dark like brown, but almost like a grayish color. It doesn't match anything that you know within like the natural world anyhow. But it is a decently made card. It's not uh, huge by any means, but it definitely suits exactly what you're needing it for. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, since I have that bag of holding, I'm not super concerned about the space. But I would, uh, yeah, start getting it cleaned up and and uh, ready for use as a guild vehicle. So I would um, probably try to find some sort of white paint or something along those lines. And, and as carefully as I'm able to, uh, draw out the Adventuring Guild logo on the side of it with the words Adventuring Guild um, on the side of it. <laughs> trying to think of how you could misspell that somehow uh, and for, <laughs> for Olman not, not Olman, for uh, Dandabin in the future <laughs> yeah, exactly uh, I'd say uh, sort of enough paint to coat the outside, it only costs you like two, two uh, copper pieces oh, awesome and I won't make you roll for the Adventuring Guild logo you probably yeah. have had enough experience with the Adventuring Guild logo in real life to where you could sufficiently paint it on the exterior of something without much issue. Awesome. Yeah, I would say it definitely doesn't look super artistic by any means, but I figure once we get an actual artist to join the guild, I'll let them redo it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, but I would just spend, like I said, the rest of the day doing that. Um, I would get my horse out, take it for a uh, gallop about, and then uh, just head back to the uh, Tinker's Guild later on, go for a run, and call it a night. That would be basically all I wanted to accomplish. Awesome. Take your horse opponent out for maybe perhaps a run with you. Ooh, that's a cool idea. Yeah, uh, holding on to the reins, uh, trotting. You know, it's barely clomping next to me as I, uh, yeah. as I run. Oh, I would check on the book to see if uh, the Raven Queen ever responded. Okay. Uh, roll me another d20. I'm liking this d20 a lot more. That was a 14. Uh, you see a few splotches of ink. Very small, as if someone had held a quill above and is just sort of uh, thinking upon the answer. 
like the ink has spilled and sort of dropped down a few watches across the page, but there is no answer currently. All right, I'll just leave the book there, still open, and uh, uh, call it a night and check it tomorrow um, upon waking. All right. All right. Well, then I think that's about it for this one. Next time we get together, we'll be doing uh, hopefully a group game then. Yeah, perfect. I can't wait. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, Braden, for running uh, through this with me. And uh, hopefully I won't sound as much like a frog tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) Fingers crossed. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much, Braden. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Chaos Plan. If you would like to join the show and help support our podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash adventuringguild. And if you'd like to know more about the show, find our rules, downloads, maps, character sheets, etc., visit our website at www.theadventuringguild.com.